So we are back from the lunch break and we will continue with uh, the BPF support in the GNU tool chain. Okay. Well, hi everyone. Thanks for coming. This is a update on the BPF support in the GNU tool chain. Uh, maybe also applicably just compiled BPF in general. Um, this talk isn't as much of a talk as some of the ones that have been so far. I really only hope to go, you know, 10 minutes over some status stuff and then have discussion for the rest. But if there's not that many BPF people in the room, then it's going to be quite short. But maybe we get ahead of schedule. So, yeah, little overview of the talk. It'll basically be just a quick status update on where we're at and then we've got problems. There are problems for compiled BPF generally, problems for GCC. Uh, yeah. So basically, the big milestone for us in the last year or so has been that we're, it, with GCC, with the new tool chain, we're finally compiling all of the kernel BPF self-tests, and most of them are passing. And as people are probably familiar with, if you know BPF, um, the self-tests are very exhaustive, and they do a lot of weird things that not only represent you know, what people typically do with BPF, but all of the edge cases also. So they're a really good milestone for judging, you know, how complete are we? And even without passing fully all of the self-tests, for some reasons that I'll get into, you can compile things like dtrace and systemd and others. And so with that, people are starting to pick up the toolchain, and it's shipped in various distros. So it's been shipped in Oracle Linux for a while. That's just my employer. Um, Debian picked it up a while back, Gentoo, and finally Fedora recently has also picked it up. And they're starting to build things with it also, so at least for, with Gentoo, I know they're building the BPF components of systemd now with GCC. So that's, that's pretty nice because it means you can do it and it's useful and it gives people options. So some of the stuff that's gone on recently, really, this is like just quickly what we've done in the last year or so. Um, all the new BPF instructions we've added uh, in support in the assembler, so you have the unconditional byte swapping, whereas before the only way to really swap bytes was the Endian instructions. Uh, you've got the longer go-tos with larger target displacements, signed memory loads, signed uh, register moves, and then signed division and modulus, which was something that we suggested would be needed a few years ago. They picked it up since it turns out to be useful. Um, with the new instructions, there's new kinds of relax relaxations that can be done in the assembler, so you can widen a jump if you have a longer jump displacement. You know, you make use of the new instruction to be able to jump to further targets. Uh, we have an option for, you know, enabling or disabling that relaxation in the assembler, and it's on by default. <coughs> ah, this, uh, another issue that cropped up recently was that there is a degree of inconsistency in terms of how uh, immediates were handled between the GNU assembler and uh, the LLVM BPF assembler. Um, so we worked together to sort of consolidate that to make sure we're doing the same thing. And the solution is basically just, if you have an immediate field that is n bits, then as long as it's two's complement encoding fits in those n bits, we accept it and then leave it up to the instruction to figure out what to do with it. And that resolved some discrepancies that we were seeing between what exactly the two assemblers were doing and allows us to stay in sync. Um, with that, another, another thing that cropped up while we were doing this and with the the new longer jumps and the relaxations that we're able to do is there are some cases where we really don't want to, we, we won't do any relaxation for immediates in jump instructions. We'll only try to do relaxations if there's some expression involved. So if you've got an expression that's resolved in the assembler, only do a relaxation then if you need to and don't try to do it for anything that's an immediate in a jump because you might end up doing the wrong thing. Um, we also, a lot of this is, you know, uh, well, anyway, the ELF header flags. So this is something that you have you know, in, in all ELF files. You have some machine dependent bits, so we decided we can use some of those to actually encode the BPF, the CPU version that, was, that it was compiled for. So since you've got different versions of the ISA that's evolved over time and different kernels that, are, that know about some of those ISAs, you need to be able to tell quickly you know, what's actually supported and what's not. So the, the Machine dependent bits in the ELF header are a good way to encode that, and you can just encode. Uh, this doesn't show up on there. Okay, on my screen, there's something blocking the bottom line, but anyway. Um, 
you've got the header flags and they're respected. So if you, you know, are trying to disassemble a VPF program or whatever, you don't have to manually supply the exact instruction version anymore. They can, it, it can read the flags and give you the right instructions or tell you that, you know, this, this, um, the header flags say it's version three, but there's somehow some version CPU v4 instruction in there. Then the disassembler will tell you basically unknown because it was an instruction that didn't exist in the older ISA. That's it for bin utils. Um, on the GCC side, there's a lot more. So some of these are more or less exciting depending on who you ask. Um, first thing is that for a long time we had a, a BPF helpers.h that was actually shipped by the compiler toolchain because there were some things in the, the kernel BPF helpers that GCC couldn't deal with. Now we finally got everything we need to deal with that so we can get rid of the compiler shipped one and everybody uses the same file, which is great because it, it's a much less of a, a, a pain for everybody involved, including us. Um, the BPF compile once run everywhere, which I think Cupertino has, has some stuff to talk about, um, is finally done in GCC so we, we can handle all the different kinds of core relocations and we have code that's, you know, it's compatible with what is emitted from LLVM. So it works and it's, it's nice. Um, a couple of changes to defaults. Um, first of all, just generating BTF by default with minus G. So before you always had to specify minus G BTF because minus G was the, the, the default debug information was dwarf. So you compile a BPF program, you say minus G and you get dwarf, not BTF. Uh, so that's just a simple default change that I think makes people's lives easier. And um, the other default is with the assembly syntax. So since the beginning, there have been sort of these two competing syntaxes, one coming, one that's the sort of the pseudo C that is much more commonly used in the kernel and I think by BPF program. Oh, there's a question. So for BPF target, uh, minus G, G will default BTF, so dwarf, dwarf will not be generated. Right, you, can, you uh, can still generate dwarf if you want. You just have to say minus G dwarf. Oh, okay. So if you just give a bare minus G, it'll give you BTF. Then the, if you try to debug BD, BT, BTF program, you still need to use the dwarf information, right? For GDB well, work. Yeah, if you were going to use GDB or something to debug. I mean, then dash G need, will not be enable. So dash G will not, uh, if you compile the BPF tar, uh, uh, program for BPF target, the dash G will not be uh, default to enable the GDB work because it's not, no DOF information. If you try to use the GDB to debug the object file for the BPF target object file, yeah. then there's no DOF information, then the GDB done will, will not work. Yeah, well, I think debugging BPF with GDB isn't really something that people commonly do, so. But uh, it works, enough. though. It does technically work. There, there is a BPF simulator. Um, it would be great to expand it, but that's sort of a time allowing eventually. Um, but yeah, you, it, Minus G generates BTF by default. If you also want dwarf, you can get both at the same time by doing a minus G and a minus G dwarf or explicitly minus G BTF minus G dwarf. You can get both in the same compiler invocation. Um, yeah, so the, the assembly syntax thing, since the beginning we've had the sort of the pseudo C style thing uh, that is, that's more common in the kernel and there was a, a more sort of standard assembly syntax that we borrowed from the user space BPF project. Um, there, there have been opinion wars about this in the past, but basically, in practice, we really uh, had to switch to emitting the pseudo C style assembly by default, and that's mostly just due to the prevalence of inline assembly in the kernel headers that are written in that syntax. And so if you try to, you have inline assembly that's in one syntax and the compiler assembles to something else, the assembler says, I don't know what the hell to do with this, because you've got two different assembly syntaxes in the same output. Um, uh, another one, just down at the bottom, this the inline memory operations. So BPF, you can't really fall back on library calls. There were several cases where GCC was still doing that, and then there is no library implementation of mem copy for BPF. So just making sure that that is always uh, basically done in a way that is inline and is also something that the verifier can understand and accept. So that, that solves that problem. Uh, 
kind of speed up a little because some of these aren't very interesting. Basically, we have the feature macros now. And can you speak uh, yeah. a little how you're doing this uh, last, uh, is it like full unroll of mem copy, mem set? Uh, for the moment, it is, but. Is there like a limit you unroll? Yeah, so, like so a there's, a, there's a flag, there's a M inline memops threshold that says, you know, I will fully unroll up to some, some threshold, say like 1,024 bytes. And what's the default, 1,000? I think the default is 1,024, yeah. It's, it, it can be improved a lot. Right and, now it's very and stupid. And how do you know the, how would you deal with alignment? How would you pick whether to like do mem copy one byte at a time or eight byte? It's dependent on the mode of the thing that you're mem copying. So yeah, if you, if you mem copy stuff that's all one byte aligned, then it's, it gives you one byte aligned mem copies, one byte at a time. Um, this came up at LSFMM too, and I think you mentioned that like we can use a bounded loop that's still a verifier friendly. Uh, that would still be verifier friendly. So right now it's very stupid, but it can be better. Um, yeah, we have these feature macros. So we've for a long time had flags specifying what kinds of instructions to generate, but it's much more useful to have feature macros since programs check you know what features are actually available. Uh, so th those are provided now. Ah, yes, okay. Another thing that happened is um, with BTF, with pruning, um, we got complaints basically that the BTF that was generated by GCC was huge. And it was huge. And looking into why, um, basically it comes down to several, this is, this is an example from a self-test, but the self-tests include like some of the kernel headers, BPF headers, and then some of them just have, you know, hash include VM Linux.h, right? Um, in GCC, the BTF implementation is translating from Dwarf internally because it was decided a few years ago that in GCC, the canonical debug representation will be the internal Dwarf die tree. And so what that means is if you hash include stuff, you have everything that's in those headers. Uh, if, you, if you generate Dwarf for them, you get all of the Dwarf for all of the types. If you then translate all that Dwarf into BTF, you have BTF for all of the types and all of the headers even though you know, the common case in BPF programs is you use one or two things, right? And you don't care about the rest. Um, so yeah, we, we implemented the, the, basically what Clang does that's different is the way that it generates BTF is based on traversing like, okay, what are the variables that we have in this program and what is actually used? And let's only generate types for that. So we added an option in GCC, which is to minus G prune BTF, which is on by default now, so we generate the same thing where rather than translating all of the dwarf, it's following the, the same algorithm. Basically, start from what you actually use and then anything that you don't care about because it's just like structures that are only referenced through a pointer member of some structure that you're only accessing one field of, you can just throw away the rest of the information for a lot of those structs that you're not actually accessing and basically replace it with a forward. So you have a pointer to a forward and the program doesn't care about any of the types that are behind that forward, so you save a lot of space. And that's how you end up you know, going from emitting 8,700 types for one test to just 56. Oh, forgot I had this slide. Anyway, there's an option. It's enabled by default for BPF with minus G. Um, an important aspect of this is that the main, the main user of BTF, right, is BPF programs, but there's also an aspect where, obviously, we, we have this need of BTF for the kernel as a whole, and the BTF for the kernel as a whole right now is done by translating from Dwarf, which sounds a whole lot like the original way that GCC was generating that BTF. So that's, that's sort of the reasoning behind there being a switch, is in reality, there's, there's these two different modes of BTF generation. One is do what Clang does and prune, and one is, you know, give me BTF for everything in the program, and in the future, this could potentially be used to generate all of the BTF for the kernel directly rather than going through the entire step of translating Dwarf. Which is the next step. Yeah, which I think Nick will talk about in the next talk. Um, so yeah, speaking of the kernel self-test, I mentioned earlier that they compile now, most of them pass. This is numbers from, I don't know, a week or two ago, so they're not up to date really, but of the tests that are failing, we know why, I mean, it's, it's not a, some huge mystery. Uh, we don't have the BTF decal tag, BTF type tag implementation in GCC, I'll get into that. 
Um, there are some cases where we are emitting code that has been transformed by some optimization that is a valid optimization, it's valid code, but the verifier doesn't understand the pattern, so it gets rejected. That's something that, you know, is a, an ongoing problem, I think, for both us and for LLVM. And just some of the, the, the most recent BPF features, things like BPF fast call, they're, you know, we're just not catching up as quickly as they're being added. Uh, so that's, that's, the, that's the quick overview. Now it's time to get into some of the more discussion questions. So there's, there's the CI, right? Um, it exists for LLVM for a while. Uh, we've been working on adding, adding GCC support for the, the, self, the CI. So every time you check in a patch, it runs all of the self-tests. It builds and runs the self-tests with GCC as well. Um, obviously, since we're not passing all the self-tests, that would be pretty stupid to put in. So for the starters, it's just going to be compile all the self-tests. And then once all of them, once we get all of the self-tests working, then we can go to the next step and have it be the same on par with the Clang, um, the CI for Clang. There's a, yeah, Andrew. It doesn't have to be that way. Like we, as, as long as you can compile all the code, mm -hmm. we can run subset of tests. It's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can maintain I mean, like the GCC specific you know, yeah, allow we, these we, we have that. We okay. yeah, we, we added it. There were just some delays in the GitHub like integration thing. I think we can lock Manu and Cooper in a room until they finish it. But it's it's basically ready. We were hoping it was be ready for now, but it's just a small delay. <laughs> um, this is sort of another very recent and sort of open question in regards to the atomic stuff. So there are the atomic instructions. Then we found that there were issues where, depending on whether the return value was used or not, for some of those built-ins that you were generating um, either the atomic instruction or the, the, the instructions were, that were generated were differing based on whether the, built, the return value of the built-in was being used or not. And so then just a few days ago, there's, there's um, there was an LLVM patch set to basically fix that and start respecting the memory, um, the memory order argument. So, so the atomic built-ins, all of them have an a argument to pass to say sequentially consistent or relaxed or whatever the memory ordering that you want is. Um, until now, there hasn't been really a way of actually respecting that. Um, it's also in a very interesting relation to the talk. I think Paul McKenney is giving a talk on the BPF memory model stuff on Friday. So, is that right? I don't know, but. But on this, what you have done in the LVM patch, um, yeah. it looks perfect to us. So as soon as that gets merged, then we will just put the corresponding support in GCC. Yeah, that's basically all I was getting at is, you know, there's this LLVM patch set. It looks good. It looks reasonable. It's just like it only showed up a few days ago. So waiting for everything to settle out. We've got GCC bug for it. That'll get updated. Um, OK. Yeah. yeah. So regarding the uh, underscore atomic, yeah. so you what do you mean ignores? Ignores only from BTF point of view, or ignores the actual, doesn't generate the atomic instructions, atomic access. No, no, so this is from the BTF point of view. So this oh, was- only from BTF, there, okay. There's the atomic qualifier, which behaves like a const or a volatile. Um, I think the difference, like LLVM was discarding the whole, the whole chain of type, so it saw an atomic and it stopped there. GCC was doing something different, but also not you know, correct in terms of if you had a type that was qualified with atomic, it would skip the atomic and generate everything else for the type, but then it's not really the, the original type that you had. So if, if, we're going to, if we're going to add this BTF kind atomic thing, which it looks like we want to, I mean, this is kind of an open question, right? Uh, is there any objection? Is there an objection? BTF? I think it's in the LLVM patch that you had a BTF kind atomic and then. Uh, right, and basically uh, this uh, uh, atomic type and uh, it Actually, the modifier similar to a constant, yeah, or right. Strict uh, volatile, and the current uh, LLVM implementation is uh, you see ignore that and uh, go to the next one. For example, you could have a volatile atomic int. So in BTF, you generate a volatile int, 
skip the atomic. Right. That's all. But do we want but to continue doing so, or, we want or do we want to have a? I think we should be okay. And uh, as a based on the current usage and all this uh, atomic thing is only used in BPF program, and nothing else. And the user space, there's no need actually. Even people could say I have an atomic int and I have a global variable pass that, but from the user space and we can just have a, in the skeleton, we can just have a int type instead of atomic okay. int. So it should be okay, I think. And also uh, for this uh, uh, atomic uh, operations, and you have to be like uh, multiple, basically one, two, four, eight bytes. And uh, right. you cannot say, okay, I have a 16 byte or I have a struct to do an atomic operation. That won't work. Right. From that perspective, I think we can ignore that. Okay, there's a question right behind you. Just a note, I was, I was going, going to ask why don't, we, uh, why don't we just treat these like type tags, but then it occurred to me that in C11 and above, there is an atomic qualifier in, in yeah. C itself, which behaves in exactly the same way, so we should probably admit the same thing for user space too. Um, this is exactly what atomic is for, you'd think. I think it's even spelled the same way. Yeah, so. so it seems like a, a, qualifi a new qualifier is just right. It's a CV call. Well, is atomic used in the kernel? In user space, and uh, currently, I don't think we have a use case for atomic this thing. And, uh, but I don't know at this point. Okay. From my experience, and uh, we, we try to focus on the kernel side the atomic. And, uh, whether we should have user space, atomic, and operate on the same data, I'm not sure. Okay. So I guess for, for now it sounds like just skip having the BTF kind atomic and keep on basically skipping You can ignore it. Uh, right now, and if really necessary, and we can add this BTF kind atomic. But okay. I don't see need now. Or, yeah. Or we don't have use case Okay. For that. Well, good. So less work for me. Um, uh, so, yeah, now getting into some of the meat stuff. Um, people say, you know, where, where are the type tags in GCC? Where's the BTF type tag support? And the answer is basically the dwarf format is something that the GCC maintainers are not happy with. And they have, they raise criticisms in the review of the dwarf format. And they're right, basically, from my point of view. Um, the, the current, so, so right now, GCC does not emit anything for BTF type tag, BTF decal tag. Uh, Clang is doing the, the, in dwarf, right, this is the dwarf representation of the tags because you need to represent them in both BTF and dwarf so that the kernel BTF, which is translated from dwarf through PA, PA hole, has, can generate the tags. Um, the, the format that today Clang emits is based on a parent-child relationship in dwarf where you have the child of the type, um, but it can only apply to pointers. The proposed format, which there's a, already a patch set prepared for LLVM that's been there for like more than a year at this point, and which I also wrote patches for in GCC, which led to the following discussion, um, basically changes it so that you have the, the annotations are child dies of exactly the types that they annotate. The problem with that is it prevents you from sharing annotation dies, which means that if you have multiple types that have the same set of annotations, you have to have duplicate dies for each, for each annotation, even if it's the same one repeated many times across different types. And so that was, that was sort of the main source of objection sending this patch to GCC is they say, you know, we think you can do better with the dwarf format. And so coming from Cauldron last weekend, where I talked about this because I want to make progress, I mean, we have a new proposal I don't know if this is going to go over well, make, you know, changing the format again. Um, but basically, rather than do the parent-child thing, we can add an, not only a dwarf extension that is the tag for the new kind of die, but also a new attribute, which can be placed into existing dies. And basically, that attribute is just another dwarf die reference that if, if it's non-null, it points to an annotation die. And then if you have multiple annotations, they can chain together by using by each having that, an, a, an attribute annotation that chains to the next one. And what that lets you do, well, it, it, first of all, it looks something like this. So rather than a parent-child relationship, it's a new attribute in any given type. 
that points to an annotation die that holds the information. And I've reused the same style that we have currently of, of using the, the AT name and the const value. So to hold, say, BTF type tag and then the value of tag one or tag two or RCU or user or whatever. Um, and for more complicated cases, you start to be able to reuse them because now this is the same example from before where you have just two ints, X and Y. One of them has tag one and tag two and the other is just tag one. Now we can actually share the underlying dwarf dies of the annotations. And that way we're not, we're not duplicating like we were before. We had to duplicate the whole annotation die for tag one. And if there were more types, then it, the problem compounds because you're duplicating in the parent-child relationship format, you're duplicating that die for every type that is annotated that way. This lets us share the underlying dies and then chain them together and have a, have a, a subchain style thing here. So they both share the tag one and both, both, base, both integer types can point to that for the annotation. Um, and of course, it, they, don't, they don't have to both be integers, they could be anything. So here you just replace one of them with some kind of attributed pointer to a struct. And we've still only got two annotation dies, but we've got a lot more tags in the source code. So we're, we're a lot more efficient with the format, right? Because we're, re we're reusing all the dies. And this is advantageous also because it gives us an interesting property here, which is the ordering of the tags in the source is actually preserved. And this was something that I think we was talked about to some degree of years ago, but it's, it's an interesting question. So one question I have uh, on top of the like, is this new dwarf format okay and interesting to you is the ordering question. Is it something that is worth preserving? I mean, I think it's, it gives some interesting semantic implications that, that you can preserve the order of the tags, whereas with a parent-child relationship, you're not you know, the, the child dies could be generated in any order. That's not something that you, sh you should be relying on. Is this the stack for Bethel tags? Yeah, basically, right? Like, declaration tags are easier because they're always, like, they're on a variable or something that's a leaf, so. But it's, you, you would use the same attribute and point to an annotation, and then if you have a ton of things that have the same decal tag, you just. What does this look like in BTF? In BTF? BTF, it looks exactly the same as, as it currently does. It's just. So the reason I asked whether decal tag has the same kind of ordering and all this stuff, we already rely on ordering for the decal tags in self-tests. Yes. So we, we, preserving we the order is, I guess, important in general. Yeah, but so the, the problem with the parent-child thing in Dwarf is you should not be relying on an ordering because that's, that's implementation dependent. There's, yeah. there's nothing in Dwarf that says the ordering of the children I mean, children will be I think this makes sense, right? Like, as long as we emit the same sort of BTF and we have yeah, ordering yeah, guarantees, yeah. like, I don't see the problem. Okay. I mean, the reason this is kind of an open thing is because, obviously, we need LLVM to do the same sort of Dwarf format, and then PA hole has to be adapted to change the Dwarf. But if you're okay with that, then I think this format improves stuff a lot, and we've already kind of gotten okay from the GCC maintainers, you know, pending me not doing a stupid implementation, which is a big if. But just my opinion, but we have been waiting for the GCC support for tax for so long then like whatever yeah. makes this happen. I guess this makes sense for me. Yeah, I mean, I think in general also it's, this is kind of the right way, I think, to, to add something like this in Dwarf. And just from my own experience, I already have a, a patch that does this in the Dwarf in GCC and it's like, it's a lot more clean and natural. It sort of fits into the way the rest of the Dwarf is generated, so. Hopefully everybody is, you know, on board with this, and we can we can change it. I, I guess it's more up to the people who will be doing the work. So, but once this gets in, added in GCC, we need to remember that in the kernel on the kernel side, you have to change the macros to use C two X uh, attribute syntax. Yeah, well, that's a whole. But that can be a feature with access, right? It's a macro. Sorry. Uh, the question was about detecting it at compilation time. No, well, no, I mean, my point is that if you are going to, if you want to reuse a sparse annotations in the kernel as compiler attributes, if you are building, I mean, if uh, 
the classical GNU attribute syntax in the compiler, it doesn't associate the same that the sparse annotations. But the C2X, they do. Yeah. So that's why we discussed this some time ago, yeah. yeah I know it's annoying, but so. But I think that in the kernel, you only have to change one macro, right? One yeah. definition. and. Because all, all of the things, you know, like user and RCU and whatnot that you would want to replace or like use type tag for, if, if they're all using macros, you just change the definition of the macro and it's easy, yeah. Uh, so good, I mean, more to follow on that, I guess. Uh, yeah, this kind of summarizes it, so. I think, yeah, so what's, what's next? Um, there are some as aspects of core that I think Cupertino has to talk about. Uh, hi everyone. It's a question from. Uh, yeah, before, uh, assuming this uh, add uh, add annotation stuff will well, hopefully fingers crossed land soon. Uh, yeah. What are <laughs> the chances of it uh, appearing in uh, all the min backports? You know, like I think the BPF backend you managed to push all the way to like yeah. GCC fourteen, right? This kind of stuff. Probably not, right? So it's only will be GCC, whatever, 16, 17? Yeah. Um. OK, the current situation is that GCC 14 is out, yeah. but GCC 15 will be released uh, next year. Um, we have some margin. In, th in principle, you should not be backporting new functionality into maintenance branches. Right. However, for the BPF backend, we have certain margin in the sense that if we go and say, look, we absolutely need this functionality, otherwise it, it doesn't work, I think we can get with some backports in them. In the, but this particular work is not backend specific, right? Right. But, I mean, so this isn't a dwarf that's we can, a dwarf for everyone. We could try to negotiate, but it will require to negotiate. Who is maintaining 14? Is it Richie? I think he is, yeah. So. We, can, we can negotiate, but we can't promise that it will be possible to do so. Yeah, also to be useful, it would, you know, you, we need to add the BTF type tag and decal tag attributes, and we could do it in the back end, and that would probably be not a problem to, to backport, but doing it in the C front end would be more problematic to backport, yeah. We can try. Um, okay, so now I'll be speaking about core. So in the past one and a half years, I've been implementing core in GCC, on and off. And um, so for those that don't know, core is, stands for Compile Once Run Everywhere, and is basically a mechanism to allow a BPF application to run in multiple versions of the operating system, in this particular case, Linux. And um, yeah, in the case of the implementation of, of GCC, we actually have to change a little bit the prototype of the built-ins um, such that they would comply with the internals of GCC since GCC would be optimizing away some of the, the initial uh, built-ins definitions. So we do that in the abstraction in a, uh, in a, in the, as a macros like Clang also used in this BPF core read.h. Um, the, also there's other difference between Clang implementations that we require that this attribute push or Clang attribute push, GCC is not able to support these or it will be very hard to implement it. So uh, preferably we would like to actually explicitly um, at attribute each structure for the requirements. Uh, I forgot to mention like current implementation upstream is in par with, with Clang with the exception of one, one or two bugs, small ones, but while we, while we are not really running in the CI, we didn't care to push it early, uh, but there's something simple. And uh, yeah, and the, for the rest of my slides, at least, I would like to discuss the, the, a little bit of the next steps of what we can do in core and what there is to, to improve. So in this example, it's like, I can also explain a little bit how how core operates. So what happens is that when you have such, such uh, an expression in a C application and you have to run it in multiple kernels, then it depends if, if one kernel actually changed the above structures 
uh, a little bit, then Core allows to adapt the code uh, such that it would uh, point to the right structure field. So in, in this example, we can see on the right side what Clang generates, which, um, which uh, if, if you see, actually takes the uh, below expression, which because containing an I, uh, 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 an index variable that is non-defined at compile time, it cannot expand it to a single uh, store instruction with offsetted by the specific uh, position of, of the field. In this particular case, it would, if I was one instead, it would actually generate a single store with the offset to the actual position of the field already because it contained all the information, everything would be constant. In this particular case, it actually splits it into expressions, which would be, uh, sorry, this is a little bit slow. So the, this part of the expression, which takes the offset for the QS field, and then does the operation on the computation of, of, of the offset of I, and then the rest of the expression, uh, which the rest of the expression would be for accessing the, the field Y, okay? So in this particular case, you can see that that multiplication by three actually doesn't contain um, any other information about the size of QS. So when actually this, you should know that this is not what is upstream. GCC currently, uh, in our version, can actually support this thing, which would be to to take the size of QS and create also a, a relocation for, for computing the, the size of the struct Q and so on. This, the, the access of I, I variable would also be uh, core compatible, which in case of Clang is not. So I, I wonder if you were aware of that, if that makes sense to actually improve and support and uh, the, the other point is like, in case I would be an enum, the same thing would apply, but it would require an extra core relocation in order to compute the value of I, of I, sorry, of the enum itself. So just an opportunity to actually improve core. Uh, this other slide is more of like a problem we figured out, we found out with the verifier and some of the restrictions. So documentation of the verifier speci clearly specifies that, you go ahead, sorry. Yeah, probably let's quickly discuss this size eight part. Uh, yeah, looks like a bug to me. Probably Clank should have been doing this. I don't know how we missed it. Okay. Hyun Hong, any thoughts? And the uh, enum here. There's no enum. Sorry, the enum part would be if uh, I, maybe I should go to the previous slide because it's preferable. You have the code and you have y here, right? And then somewhere i, which is initially r2, I presume, by the template, by the parameters of the function, then is multiplied by 8 to compute the offsets to access this, po this position. And you, there's no relocation for the for computing the size. Sorry. Yeah, I think I need to try the example actually. Yeah, I actually, I I, I put a got bolt link here just to, to for you to to check it out. Here to see whether we miss this case or not, and uh, based on the current algorithm, most in most cases we try to calculate and uh, directly multiple one like a point b point c something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm not sure whether we have this issue or not. So okay, double check. Yeah, yeah, so we should check and improve it maybe. So, uh, 
So if I if I might move to to the other thing, so like I was saying, the the, the verifier clearly specifies some ground rules for uh, what this pointer to context um, can do. Uh, it, it it says that a pointer to context is given on the first argument, that, but then it says that it's transferable to other registers. So during the code, actually it can go from R1 to R2 or R3, and then the compiler must somehow be able to follow this, this in order to to follow the Oh, you have a question there. What? Context restriction is there because, like, we cannot do rewrites, right? Because uh, in this case, it can be, well, from like 16 will be rewritten to something else. Like, for that's why. And for the so, I don't see how we can drop this restriction. But what we added to LLVM that probably wasn't uh, well. We didn't advertise it much, and it's currently not uh, propagated through the sources. But there is a f attribute called preserve uh, static offset or something, or context offset, and exactly there to tell Clang that it should not do this kind of optimization. Yeah, um, not so easy in, in GCC, I guess. Uh, Why? Uh, cannot answer now. <laughs> Some time ago that I did this. Actually, uh, to be fair, I tried to, to, to reproduce this thing this morning and I could not with the, I don't know where the fix is. Something changed either in GCC or in, or, or in, um, in PPF Next. And this is not producing the same code now. So, I don't know. So but, this is but this is this is Clang Clang, Clang generated no, no, no. or GCC this generated? Is, this is GCC generated. Ah, Sorry okay. for the, the mistake. Yeah. So, um, but just to say that even if it's not, uh, even if we disable all those, uh, or disable or change the the optimization such that this code is not produced, it doesn't mean that someone else will come up with some other optimization, will set it up, and will start generating this thing, and we cannot comply. So. In well, any case, that's, that's my, my perception is that we, we should actually provide more information to the compiler in order to, yes. to deal with these so, things yeah, properly. So, yeah, that's what we're doing. So, like, for this case, because it's a uh, task reiterator, the context actually not been rewritten. So, it's this, in, like, in this, for this particular, like, uh, task reiterator, we can uh, allow this. So, like, this uh, reference of modified context pointer probably can be dropped, but not for the other cases, like SKB, because SKB context is being rewritten by the verifier, so the, the restriction will stay. But mm -hmm. those we will mark from, like, all the way from UAPI, and compiler will see the attribute on this, like, context argument. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing in LVM to prevent uh, this yeah. type of transformation. So just, all of the offsets will stay constant. So just just a question. So in, do you think in this particular case you would be able to relax or yes. to allow? Yeah, okay. for, for this case. Because yes. most likely you probably could infer the, the, the value that is coming. It would be a constant in most of the optimizations that you do. Yeah, like in this case, because the context is not being rewritten by the verifier, it's fine. So. Okay. It's this well check is just done generically, and we didn't bother making it better for this case because well, we didn't okay. see compilers doing this kind of transformation. No, but GCC the, the, at least this particular this particular type it does, and if he sees that the 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 context is not passed through to the other function, it might even add to the context and then access it. To, with offset zero instead of uh, having the the, yeah. the register well, context. Well, LVM, LVM does it as well from time to time. It's just not that often. But okay. yeah, so there is it's yeah two way to fix it. Okay, okay. So um, yeah, I think I think that's all for 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 my part of the talk. Thank you. So, I mean, I have a lot more slides than I expected to get through. It was just kind of a cover as many of these topics as we can until we run out of time. But if, if there's other, like, unrelated questions people have, I want to make sure there's some time to discuss them. Otherwise, I...
keep going. Okay. Um, let's see. So yeah, the, the, one of the next things here, and this is related to the following talk, but right now, because generating BTF for the kernel relies on the, the, the translation done by PA hole, it introduces a dependency between dwarf and BTF where anything that we want to express in BTF, at least for the kernel use case, has to be able to be conveyed in some form in, in Dwarf or deducible from some other source available to PA hole. So that's because the picture right now looks like this, right? So we, we compile VM Linux and the kernel modules and whatnot, have Dwarf, translate that Dwarf to BTF to produce a VM Linux BTF, and then feed that to the verifier along with the BTF of the program. Um, but it's kind of a problem, right? I mean, we're gratuitously tying together Dwarf and BTF when there doesn't necessarily need to be uh, this relation. And, you know, like we saw with type tags, it's, it's sort of difficult to extend a Dwarf without breaking it, right? The ideal format would be to represent type tags just like a const or a volatile. But if you do it that way, then any Dwarf reader that doesn't know about type tags can't, can't follow the type chain. So that's why we had to go down the route of first a parent-child relation and then adding a different attribute. Um, and the real way to extend dwarf is by going through the standard, and the standard takes, you know, it, it <laughs> takes a long time. It's a big thing. So one of the things that we're looking at, you know, is, hey, why not support merging and deduplicating BTF in, in, in bin utils, in the linker, and everything that goes along with that, and then rather than generating all of the BTF by first making all the dwarf and then doing another large step of translating it, we could di directly from the tool chain make the BTF for the kernel. And you know, there, there are some problems we have to solve with this. Like um, one obvious thing is doing LTO with BTF that, you know, that's not fixed yet. Right now the linker doesn't, the new linker doesn't know what to do with BTF because it's not expected, not really expecting it. Um, but like, then we change things and it, it just looks like this, right? Where there are still some things that PA hole is adding to BTF that, and I, I don't have a full list of this, but I know that it's doing at least with like per CPU things. Um, but PA hole has a BTF reader, so it could just read BTF that's, we generate the vast majority of the BTF for the kernel from the tool chain. PA hole reads it, makes little additions, and that produces your kernel BTF and nowhere do we have to rely on Dwarf and rely on expressing everything that we want to express in BTF in Dwarf. So, yeah, if, if you're interested in this, this, this will be coming up in the next talk, so stick around, but this is kind of a direction that we're going, and sort of on a related note, not just BTF, but BPF itself, you know, there's already some, there's some static linking of BPF programs going on in, like, uh, libbpf, I think, like there, there's a sketch for it. I don't know how much it's used in practice or if it's like totally done or what the plan is for that, but like why, why not do it with the tool chain proper? Is that something that we're, we're interested, a route that we are interested in going down or you know, are there a ton of blockers here? Yeah, this is kind of a open question in terms of is this something we wanna look at? It's something we could do. Yeah, do it. Okay, I mean, <laughs> short feedback is still good feedback, <laughs> especially when it's that, but okay. Um, obviously, the other elephant in the room, sort of, uh, there's Rust. Rust is in the kernel now. If you want BTF for the whole kernel, you got to be able to express, you know, you got to be able to represent Rust in BTF. Um, so just a couple weeks ago, there was the Congreos thing, which is the Rust for Linux meeting, and Jose went to that, and he went and talked to them and brought up BTF to them as like a, hey, do you have a plan for this, right? Like, this is something that, where we kind of, you know, here at this conference, we have all these different tracks going on. I think the Rust track is going on right now. And like, we really need to figure out some plan for this because Rust is, is in the kernel now, and Rust has a complicated type system, and it's not clear that BTF as it is can represent all of that. I mean, <laughs> Like, what's, what's the plan? Um, one of the interesting things that did come out is that they, the Rust for Linux people have said that they, you know, things like ORC, um, oh, this is, this is going off into a little bit of another topic, but 
they can reverse engineer, uh, they can get the ORC for compiled Rust. Um, so that is leveraging things like the CFI directive. So the ones generated by the Rust compiler are also probably enough for like S frames, say. Oh. But just in general, like what's the picture here with Rust? I mean. Okay. I can yeah. say that I swapped a few words about this at Cauldron uh, in the context of C++, which is even more horrifying than Rust. And right. the opinion there was that what we're interested in is, sharing, is handling the C-compatible ABI, and that probably all you need for C++, is to re which isn't already represented in CTF and BTF as well, is the type graph of... Um, basically to handle virtual bases, the type graph of classes, which is just a trivial new type kind with a, basically a struct with, a, with, a, with an inheritance pointer. Um, there may be even less than that in Rust, or there, or there might be a bit more, but I don't think it's going to be gigantic. You don't need to handle all the, all the monomorphization horrors, for example. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, just to clarify a little bit, the so basically since BTF and Les Dorf it's not designed to reflect the source code constructions, yeah. but to reflect it like the realized types, right? Whatever you have, you can patch, basically, uh, what you have in memory at the end of the day. So the feeling among the Rust for kernel people, as far as I understood it, was like, if there is something to be added to BTF to support the realized Rust types, probably it will not be that much. In particular, they were like, particularly concerned about uh, enums in Rust, which apparently are only the Rust enums are more complex than the whole C-type system. Um, but then they said, well, probably we will want to use uh, unions uh, to, re to represent them. But it, I think it was quite optimistic in the sense that most likely BP BTF will be able to represent Rust types, realize Rust types with that, that much. Uh, yeah, name, name spaces. spaces. So name spaces, right? Like that's the same for C++, but like for us at least, given there is like no inheritance, all the stuff, maybe we should just like fully qualify all the type names and keep them flat, right? Yeah. They mentioned that too, yeah. 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 And, and so like to, to the previous point, the point that like it's, it's kind of trivial to extend BTF to support like the inheritance, all stuff. It's trivial to add new type. It's less trivial to integrate that with the duplication and all the other stuff. It's, yeah. it's not trivial. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but on the duplication now, we, the next activity will yeah, get Yeah, I think we're out of time, so I don't want to get the track behind. But this was mostly just like, here are some things that we need to bring to your attention. And we don't have to solve it here necessarily, but... So also another thing, I, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, the IRS project, which I know uses Clang underneath, but they already figured out how to, or at least I know from presentations that ah. they're working on BTF generation for BPF programs. So might be able to glean some insight from there uh, yeah. for, the, for the GCC Can part of this. Personally, don't know them, but we That's we have a we have all Google, uh, GitHub project, so. Because it would be nice if you yeah, I mean. reach out. Yeah. So we don't end with like two different. Yeah, so we can all solve the problem together in one way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, anyway, that's it for, you know, there's plenty more, but we'll not get to that. Yeah. Thank you, folks. And Cooper.